I was asked to fill in today because somebody else was supposed to be here who says interesting things and exciting things and they said, well, you're coming over anyways, do you want to give a second talk? I'm also giving a JavaScript talk after lunch, which I haven't written yet, so I have to do that later on as well. But that's because I got too excited about this talk. Because I want to do something different for JFocus, which is not completely technical, but not non-technical either. And I wanted to see who here can help me with a problem that the web has right now, and that is images. And we don't talk about images enough. We talk about optimizing our code, we talk about optimizing our server setups, but then we actually end up in maintenance and people upload massive, massive images and make the web slow. And out of a sudden we have nobody to blame because we didn't think of it. So uh, I want you to, to think today about what we can do with images and make them better for the web and make them faster for the web and how we can use technology rather than humans to do that because sadly enough, as humans, we kind of failed in doing that. But I'm going to come back to that in a second. So people say that one picture says more than a thousand words and that's like this old adage that you always hear about these kind of things. And it's kind of true. The only problem is like if you don't see the image or if the image isn't loaded, then you didn't say anything. I used to work with a blind developer in, when I worked in Yahoo, a PHP developer who basically listened to what he was typing, what he was coding, and he was faster than I was. That was really depressing. But at the same time, it was really insightful as well because people always think like, well, nobody on the web is blind, right? But he just wrote JavaScript to fix websites for him and sent it to the maintainers of the website and say like, hey, I'm a technical guy, I just can't see. Can you help me with, my website, with your website and not basically tell me where something is going on? And even the company itself did this <laughs> on Christmas. We always had these Christmas parties in England where we plan things to go nice and then it ends up horribly all the time. And it was always an email with a JPEG in it where the party's got to be. And every year he would send an email back saying, like, I don't know where the party is because I cannot see a JPEG, of course, because he's blind. And my favorite was in the last year before I left, there was somebody new in HR who just answered him, like, what, are you blind? <laughs> and he just copied everybody in the company in, directors and investors and everybody, and he just said yes. <laughs> and I was, that was hilarious. And... Uh, uh, yeah, that person got fired really quickly. And it's kind of true. Pictures say a wonderful mood and pictures tell a lot of wonderful things and get you in a nice mood. That was me two weeks ago in the Bahamas. This is where I was on holiday. And this is how smug and happy I looked and not the broken shell of a man that is in front of you right now because it's cold and windy outside and wet. But these things tell us a lot of things for, in, uh, for us who can see them and who actually now are all like jealous of me and why the hell is he showing off that he had a holiday. I didn't have one for four years, okay? I wanted to have a holiday and I want to have a bit of fun and all of you should do as well. We work too much, we work too hard, we work too long. Take time off, take time off and go somewhere there's, where there's no connectivity, like in underground in London or something like that, you know? <laughs> where, basi where basically you cannot be distracted by Twitter fights and these kind of things. So that's how happy I was, and I could show that to people on the web right now, and uh, most people will see it, but if it doesn't get loaded, nothing is there. And that's where alternative text come in. That's where normally, as a good citizen of the web, I upload that thing, and I put alt equals gloating Chris in front of a marina, uh, sunglasses, unshaved, didn't comb my hair for five days, I had a holiday, you didn't, nah, nah, kind of thing. But we don't. Because most of the time we drag and drop that into an operating system or a content management system and it says image 15. And we're like, oh, okay, what? And it, it, it bites us as well because a search engine cannot index that as well. A search engine could index the alternative text and then list us for like smug redhead in the Bahamas and the website would show up. The problem is that we also became picture mad. It's far too easy to take a picture and to upload it on the web and share it on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, Hello or wherever people go right now, and we take 10,000 pictures and upload all of them because our connectivities in Sweden are fast, and we have no problem uploading those images. And I remember when Flickr came out, and I used to work with Flickr uh, back in Yahoo, people tagged their stuff, people described their images, people put them into collections, and nowadays you just put all of them on Facebook, you don't even write anything on them anymore, and it's really hard to find images. After every conference in 2007, 2008, I went to Flickr and I found every photo from everybody of that conference because they tagged them with the conference tag. Nowadays, some are on Instagram, some are on Facebook, some are on Twitter. Twitter doesn't find any images that are longer, uh, older than three weeks. 
and it's just a lot of waste going on there. We just communicate with images rather than with text. And in essence, the web is still text, and we should think about that. And the average website is 2.2 meg, which is not tough when you are in a good connection, but once you get into a country where, for example, you use uh, roaming, then it gets interesting. I was in Albania the other day, and the roaming cost from an English SIM card would your website with 2.2 meg, and this is not the worst offenders, this is the average website, would cost me the same as a cinema ticket in London. So, yeah, your website better be as good as like Cinema Paradiso or something like that and get me as much enjoyment, because otherwise I'm going to come to you and be nasty to you. But the biggest part of this, of course, is images. And I call this the inspirational obesity. We just put things on the web because they're pretty. And we put things there and we think people are excited about our 50k JavaScript library if we have a 2.5 meg hero image of a, uh, of a woman going like, because that makes our JavaScript library better, right? And uh, parallax pages and all these kind of things. We just, we, we put things on the web because we can, not because it makes sense for our end users. And we don't even test them in different environments to see how fast they are. So why does this happen? I think the biggest problem is that with mobile tablets and great hardware and fast connections, we're spoiled. We don't understand how much we actually expect from our end users if we sit on these fast machines in our offices and make these beautiful websites. When people tell me the other day, I was talking to somebody in Adobe, and he's like, well, I can't work on that one. I need a 42-inch screen. Otherwise, I don't see all my tools at the same time. And I'm like, wow. You know, I remember when, when the internet development was on any machine as well. And it's coming again with IoT and all these kind of things. But we don't feel empathy for our end users because we're on fast connections and our bosses as well. I loved it when back in the days the boss had a Windows 95 machine with IE6 and a dial-up because then, we, then they didn't ask for impossible things. Nowadays they're like, oh, it has to look great on my Retina iBook on wireless, a, 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 a tablet on wireless. And everything else I don't care about because everybody has it. And the answer is, of course, send an iPad to everybody who wants to use their website, then, it, then they're happy. But otherwise, you just overload people, and you just don't necessarily want to have that 5 megabyte image on your mobile phone. The bigger problem, of course, is maintenance. Because we build these websites, and we shave off every K, we make our fonts smaller, we make our images, we optimize them, and we make them pretty. And then somebody does maintenance for the next half year and uploads BMP pictures and things like that. Or uploads JPEGs that are 60,000 pixels because, and resizes them to 100 by 100 because nobody pays people for maintenance. Maintenance staff are the low-paid people on the internet. And, uh, and they're the ones that don't even get trained on what they're supposed to do. They don't know what different JPEG formats are. They just drag and drop an image in there, and hopefully the end user doesn't complain. And end users don't complain, they just go somewhere else. So in maintenance, we have the biggest issues, which is why we as developers should be thinking much more about CMS and much more about uploading tools and much more about making the tools that people are using to maintain our pro products better. Because we don't build products that people maintain. We build products for ourselves to show off to each other, but most of the things that run on uh, CMS like WordPress, Drupal, these kind of things, nobody, nobody makes an effort of making these better. It's like feature, 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 rather than like optimized performance-wise. So 1,426 KB of images, why does that happen? Wrong file formats is one of the biggest problems. People have a photo, they save it as a 24-bit PNG, although it doesn't have any, uh, any, um, any opacity or anything in it, just because, yeah, it does it. You do a screenshot on a Mac, it's always a PNG. It's never a JPEG. You have to set it to export as JPEG, which drives me crazy. Of course, I understand it, because PNG is the format that is G-zipped under the hood, and it's a nice format, but for end users, they always save it in the wrong way. How many JPEGs have you seen on... Uh, uh, on Facebook that are text and basically are blurry and have artifacts around them and you're like, do you, do, do you hate me? You know, do you, well, first of all, why did you choose that font and those colors and then save it as a JPEG? But people do it, they just don't understand that a PNG of that text would be a tenth of the size. Delivering high, uh, scaled high-res images to everybody, it has to look good on that retina display, and then the others, well, they just have to load it and suck it up, although they got a 604 resolution on a netbook or something like that. No automatic conversion and optimization steps. Instead of having the uploader automate, automatically tell them, like, that's a 5 megabit JPEG, 
how about I make that a bit smaller for you? Or no, you're not allowed to use a five megabyte JPEG. Sooner or later, we just turn that off and allow people to upload whatever because we don't want them to call us. And hero image instead of text content, that's something that, I, that has been annoying me for so long. Like Every time I go to a website on my desktop or laptop here and I see one image with a text in the middle and then I have to scroll to get the first content, this is not a tablet. We're not delivering posters, we're delivering websites. Give me the thing where it's there, restaurant websites, when I see a video of how the chef is making a walk. I just want to know when you're open, how much the stuff costs and where the restaurant is. Everything else is nice to have. But we start with the beautiful things because that's what you get prizes for and you get awards for. We need to work on this right now because the web is much bigger than the environment and growth happens outside of it. I worked with Mozilla before I went to Microsoft and we went a lot to India, to Africa, to Bangladesh and places like that. All the places where growth happens, where the new users are coming from. Not here, not in America where people are already bored of the internet and instead download native apps all the time or just spend their time watching Hulu or Netflix instead of looking at websites and chatting on, uh, uh, on WhatsApp instead of going to websites. So the web is still worldwide and there's a market out there that we need to cater for, but we don't because we cater for ourselves at the moment. There's surgical solutions for that. There's, for, for example, proxy browsers and cloud services. Um, a lot of them are used in those countries where you have like Opera Mini and um, uh, Squirrel Browser, whatever it's called right now, UC Browser. They automatically package your websites. They make your images look horrible. They, they, uh, they minify your JavaScript, they take out your CSS. Any JavaScript that takes longer than one second to execute gets automatically ripped out by these browsers. And these are millions of users that get that experience. So we as developers are very, very angry about this, but I'd rather have 10,000 angry developers than 1.2 million users not being able to go to a certain website because we thought it's too important to have a massive hero image and to use every JavaScript library under the, under the sun in one website. And uh, Google just released that as well on iOS and on Android that you can now turn on their cloud service and automatically do 60% of packaging. So it converts it to, uh, to uh, speedy and it also uh, optimizes the images for you and it minifies the code for you. So that way you can actually track your data storage or, or, or data consumption on your mobile device as well. I don't know how long they're going to keep that up because it's actually very, very expensive for Google and other people to do. I also don't know if I want all my, uh, all my data to go through Google servers, servers before it goes to my machine, but that's just maybe me. But these things happen. These things are solutions and that there are browsers out there and that there are services out there that are needed to do that means that we failed as web developers, as web developers, worldwide web developers. We failed because we don't understand that there's people out there that want to consume our content but don't get it because we thought everybody has these great machines and fast connections. So here are some things that we can do about this as well instead of just going to a cloud service. The problems we have is we have huge images for everybody and this will not change. People like CEOs and company owners want to see the shiny things on their iPad and you, during a pitch if you show them something beautiful they're more likely to sign it off than to tell them like look how, how optimized my alt text is. They're not going to care. But we have to think about it in the second step. We have unoptimized images. A lot of them just get like saved as web from, uh, uh, from Photoshop and nobody ever looks at them again. No alternative content. That's a big problem and I still think that it's very, very easy to type in an alternative text, but if our content management system interfaces don't entice people to do that and don't actually tell them what might be a good alternative text, then people are not going to do it and we're just going to have image 15, image 12, these kind of things on the web. And no training or incentive to add content in CMS. CMS training is never about the quality of the stuff that you put in. It's all about like what features the CMS has. Our arsenal for this. Better browsers with responsive image support, we have that now. Automated lossless image optimization tools, file level access to images for, uh, to extract metadata, scripting solutions to offer alternative content, cloud services, machine learning APIs for intelligent resizing, and machine learning for tagging. And I'm going to go through these now bit by bit. That's why I did it so fast. Better browsers with responsive image support. Responsive design has been around five, six years now, and we always had the problem with images in it, and we always had the problem with advertisements in it because they're not responsive. They're basically one fixed size, and the images 
we don't want to generate 10,000 images for every breakpoint that we have, and we don't want to scale an image with 100%. But the bigger problem was that media queries, the CSS technology that make responsive design possible, have an issue with images. And I talked about this four years ago on my blog, where I, uh, I found that media queries load everything. So if you have a media query in your CSS and you say like, okay, if it's 2000 pixels, download this massive JPEG. If it's 600 pixels, download the smaller one. If it's 300, download that one. If it's 200, don't show anything or show a background color. That's the right thing to do. The problem is the browser under the hood loads all of them because it parses the CSS before it parses the media queries. So all the, uh, there's a request to all these images and then it only shows the one that is applicable. And this was by design, because uh, as a browser, I cannot just say, OK, I stop at a media query and then go on with the rest of the CSS, because that would delay the, the rendering of the rest of your CSS. So we had to do a first parse, load all of them. And I talked with Chrome, I talked with Edge, I talked with Firefox, and we all said, like, there's no way around that. So back then, I, uh, I advocated for using match media in JavaScript. Match media is exactly the same as CSS uh, media queries. It uses the same syntax, but you can then say only generate an image when that certain width is, uh, is given, or only load the image or request the image when it's necessary. So you can request these images on demand. Of course, the problem with that is that out of a sudden your, Java, your, your images become JavaScript dependent. But it's not a problem if you, if you load the smallest for everybody and only the bigger ones when they're necessary. Like, like media queries should be working, but they cannot as browsers don't allow you to do that. But I think it's very important to understand this is still an issue. So if you think you're doing the right thing with media queries, you're still loading all the things. And that's where developer tools come in. And you just look at the net tab and you see what is really loaded. And then you understand uh, much more about this. The good news is that browsers now changed a lot, and they're evergreen, capable, and open, all of them. Internet Explorer 6 is dead, Internet Explorer 8 is dead, Internet Explorer 11 is only there when you need it, Edge is the browser that comes out of the box. Please forget about these old browsers. Stop thinking in browsers, think in capabilities. And we have the capabilities that we can build these beautiful things right now. The biggest, problem, the biggest thing there is, uh, is the uh, picture element. Picture element and source set are two ways to make this thing happen. Source set is uh, an attribute on an image that allows you to say, if it's this kind of pixel density and that kind of resolution, show that image. If it's this and that, and so on and so forth. It's a rather cryptic syntax. It's quite hard to get your head around. That's why we also advocated for the picture element. The picture element is the same as the video element is for videos. So instead of having one image with a source set on it, you have a picture element and different sources, and they have media queries on them. So instead of loading all of them, it only loads the one that is applicable to it, much like when you have a video element in it with an MP4, a WebM, and an, um, an MPEG. The, the first one that the browser understands is the one that gets loaded, and the other ones don't get touched. So it makes much more sense than having lots of images in media queries to have one picture element in your page, and that only loads the one that is applicable to both the pixel density and the resolution of the, uh, of the current device. Because that's another problem that people don't understand, that pixel density is another thing to think about. Lots of times you think, like it's, okay, it's 2,000 pixels, but uh, you still have to have a much higher resolution image for a retina display than for the others. The support is really, really good. The only uh, uh, turn in the punch bowl is Internet Explorer, but forget about that one. Edge is supporting it, Firefox, Chrome, Safari 9.1 is now supporting it as well. Opera, iOS Safari will support it as well. Opera Mini, of course, doesn't because it does not show different images. It just makes one binary blob out of your whole page. That's one of those proxy browsers that I talked about. Android browser now does it in 4.7, and Chrome for Android does it in 4.7 as well. So this is now ready for use. And there's a, uh, there's a polyfill as well called Picturefill, weirdly enough. Um, I would advise against using it by now. Don't put more and more polyfills on the web, because some of them also had like wrong detection of browsers and still gave the wrong image to all of them. So if you use a polyfill, always keep it up to date. Otherwise, you have a problem on the web again. So, uh, there's a great talk, uh, a great blog post by Jake Archibald where he explains the anatomy of responsive images, the syntax, what you have to do, for example, here in the, uh, in the source set and also in the picture and what it means to load different ones with different media queries. 
There's also a, an interactive demo on uh, Windows. I'm going, these slides are going to be online later, and I'm going to make a blog post with all the URLs, so you don't need to type them in right now. Uh, and that one shows you how to use responsive uh, images in a real environment with an article and an image, and it shows you how to use source set, how to use the pictures, how to, how to create the images for the different resolutions as well, and, some, and how to automate some of these things and what it means to actually show an image in the right format according to the right text as well. So there's the art direction with that as well. Which is uh, exciting that we finally have that across browsers because it's, it's a real problem that I just don't want to load a load, uh, large image when I don't need to. The really good story as well was uh, a month ago, about December, yeah, uh, that's, that now the WordPress core has a plugin already in there for responsive images. So if you upload an image there, it generates the picture element for you. And that is done by the responsive image working group, so all the, all the people that worked on all these different standards, so that is in there right now. So in terms of security, you have to upgrade your WordPress every 12 seconds anyways. So make sure that you upgrade it to the latest one, and then you have the picture element in there, and use that one instead of just having an image in there and writing the markup yourself like I do all the time. So, one other thing is automated tools for lossless image optimization. It's, it's always a tricky point, because you don't want images to look terrible, but you don't want them to be big as well. And there is a massive, there's lots of trickery you can do to make images look good, but there's also the whole concept of lossless image op optimization. A lot of stuff can be done in images to the file itself without the visual outcome looking differently. And a lot of this we don't know about as designers, we don't know about as developers, but the people who work on image editing tools know all about that stuff. So one tool that I want to, uh, uh, to bring to you, which you probably already, some of you are using, is ImageOptim. ImageOptim is a desktop tool, but also a command line tool that is just as simple as taking your images and dragging it into the thing, and it changes the images on your hard drive. So it, it doesn't create a new folder, it doesn't put it somewhere else, it's just a step at the end of your, I, I did all the images, drag them in there, and they already get changed for you, you don't have to worry about them. And under the hood it uses like lots and lots of different tools like PNG Out, Subflea, PNG Crush, Ad, Advanced PNG, Extended Opti PNG, JPEG Opti, Moss JPEG, Gipsicle. So it takes all the extra data that uh, Photoshop and others put in your images and takes them out. All the things that are not visual output, but are there to make it more maintainable for Photoshop, for example. So having this as a step before you upload it to your machine, or before you are sync it to your machine, or you have your grunt task running, is a very, very good idea. And it actually uh, uh, it exists as a grunt task as well, it exists uh, probably as a broccoli, whatever else you're using out there as well. The guy running it is in London, he's absolutely crazy about this, and he keeps it up to date all the time. It really hammers your machine. So when you, when you drag like lots of images in there, you will hear the fan going off. But you will also see, in this case, for example, here, that little man.png, I saved 44% just by doing this one little thing. So think about doing that before you upload your images. It's a very simple thing to do. Now, what a lot of people don't uh, forgot, which we used to do in the past already, is that images are files as well. And images are in a certain file format. And there's a thing called EXIF data in every image. EXIF metadata is a standard, I think, by Kodak from the 80s or something like that. And it gives you all the information that is in the image. So if, for example, on a Windows machine, if you do the info, file info, it gives you all kind of cool stuff about that image. You're like, where does that come from? And that comes from the metadata. The EXIF metadata is the first few bytes of an image. So what you can do in JavaScript, instead of just loading the whole image and then doing something with it, you just do the file reader API, which is now available across all browsers as well, and you read the first few bytes, and then you already know a lot about the image. You know about the size, the, the, how many colors it has, which camera it was taken with, if there was a flash used or not. And the really exciting thing about EXIF is as well that there is a Photoshop, for example, saves a thumbnail inside the image. So instead of taking the image and resizing it in JavaScript or some other tool and creating a thumbnail, you can just read the first few bytes of the image and take that thumbnail. That already exists for you. You don't have to hammer your machine and resize a massive file to a thumbnail. You can do that because it's already in the file, but most people don't know that this data exists. And it's very exciting that it does because you can do a lot of interesting things with that. 
Um, that is also again from 2012 when we worked on it on Flickr. There's a, there's a massive blog post explaining you how to parse exif client side using JavaScript and what to do with it. And uh, what it does in Flickr is in the uploader. So for example, you see here, I've got lots of images with 5.2 meg, and that was on my 25 megabit line at home. It was really not that fast. But if you drag this into the Flickr uploader, you see that the images pop up immediately. The thumbnails are already there, and it cannot be that I downloaded 5.2 meg at that time in my connection in England, where my neighbors are watching Netflix and uploading unspeakable things to the internet at the same time where I'm using it. And what it does is, is actually doing that. It's reading the EXIF data, and it takes the thumbnail from it, and it displays the thumbnail. So before you upload it, you already know that this is the right image, rather than like, oh, I dragged the wrong one in there, and it shouldn't be me dancing in my coconut costume, but I wanted to upload something to my company here. And if you go into the detailed view as well, you see that it actually has the thumbnails really fast, and then it's got this little circle running which it also has in the, um, in the tab up there. And this is where it really uploads the rest of the image. So instead of loading the whole image and giving you a bar or something like that, it shows the thumbnail and it actually keeps the file reader running and reads the rest of the image in the background while you're typing things. And this is the best way you can do it in a content management system because how many times do we fill in forms and in the background nothing happens? We need time to fill in forms. Use that kind of time to upload things in the background and to change things in the background, convert things in the background with service workers and with all kind of like uh, worker threads as well because you should use the downtime of users when they're busy to do cool stuff for them in the background rather than like, giving them a, a waiting uh, a toolbar or something like that. Of course, EXIF data is not absolutely necessary, so PNG uh, Image Optim does that for you as well. I gave a talk at a TED conference, TEDx conference about social media, and I wrote this little removephotodata.com. So if you upload, before you upload an image, for example, to Facebook or Twitter, you can drag it into that one. It takes all the EXIF data out. It makes the image a bit smaller, but more importantly, it doesn't tell the people when and where that picture was taken, because that information is in every single image that you upload on the web. So it's quite funny when people think they're anonymous and they upload a photo from them like doing rude gestures in the camera and then you look at the file, the file of it. And I wrote another little tool that is all there as well uh, where you can drag the image in there and it shows you where on the planet the image was taken. And that's cool to show people off, but at the same time, why don't you use the data in a content management system and say like, hey, this was, up, this was taken in London, shall we target London for you? shall we get that information for you automatically because we know where it was done. And uh, like it, it might freak people out, but that's good as well because people need to know the amount of un, uh, in, uh, invisible data that they're uploading to the web. Now, fallback content I think is something we don't do enough as well. We just upload the image and we hope the image loads and you see this like, uh, you see layouts where it just jumps around while the images are loading instead of having a, a placeholder with the right size and a background color. And then the image loads on top of it. That's pretty enough. And that means people know that something is coming. People don't get surprised by all of a sudden an, an image popping up and the, the, the text that they're reading right now going down. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff we can do with that. This is a, a visualization of the Crayola uh, pencils for kids in America, how they started, which colors, and how many colors are available right now as well. I love that kind of stuff. So there's um, um, Medium, for example, has this blur up technique. So they have this image that looks very blurry, and then out of a sudden it shows up as the image, and that is kind of cool. That is the HTML that they use for that effect. That is ridiculous. This is, this is not fun. I don't know what they're doing there. And there's a, a great article as well on CSS tricks, how to do that. In essence, what you do is you take a very, very small part of the image, you resize it to a, some, a very, very small version with a few K, or a few bytes actually, and you resize it up and you put a blur filter on it in CSS. This way it looks blurry and then it becomes less blurry by the time it loads. Uh, there's a few problems with that, of course, because blurring is very, very expensive to the, to, the, uh, to the CPU and to the GPU. So if you'd use that in a scrolling environment, bad idea. Blurring and, uh, and drop shadows and gradients in a, blur, uh, in a scrolling environment, never a good plan on a mobile device. But uh, uh, for desktop, like they do it, it's not, it's not that much of a bad idea. But again, they generate an extra JPEG for that little blurry one. 
And sometimes you, you, uh, you embed it as base64 in the page so you don't have another HTTP request. But you could use the JPEG in the EXIF data for that one as well. So you don't need to actually create an extra file. You just read the same file and then you read it in the background as well. So that's one way how to could optimize that one for better use. The way you find out which images, uh, which, num uh, which, p which colors are used, so if you have a background color and then just change, to the, change the image to the background color is Canvas. HTML5 canvas, for, for, for the canvas, every image is just a collection of pixels. It's a massive array of RGBA values and from left to right and top, uh, uh, top to bottom. So I'm, uh, when I was on holiday, uh, in between my jobs, I wrote this massive article about pixels and, uh, and canvas. And this is, for example, what I do here. You read that image and you find there's 1024 uh, black pixels and the others are gray and these kind of things. That was done in the Commodore 64, that's why it's only four colors. Yeah, I'm kind of geeky. This is the code how you do that. Don't need to go into detail, but it's very, very simple to find out which colors have been used and which were the most predominant colors. This is a good thing to do on your server, in Node or something like that, or in a web worker. Don't do it on every image in every blog post directly, because that would actually burn the machine of your end users, unless you do it in a worker, but it's still, that's the kind of stuff that should happen in the content management system or when you upload it. When you upload it, it should tell you, oh, by the way, these are the, image, these are the colors in the image. Which one do you want to be the background color while the image is loading? How cool would that be to put in a content management system? And that's the kind of WordPress plugins that I'm writing at the moment. There is also Colorify.js, which does that in JavaScript. So it automatically finds out the images and does the background colors. It also generates gradients if you want to have gradients. Again, please don't do that on a scrolling environment. If it's really a desktop with a lot of space, fine. But I, 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 it's kind of weird. We spent about three years making rounded corners and gradients happen, and then we got uh, flat design, and nobody wants to use them any longer. And you're like, thanks. But <laughs> gradients and drop shadows are really the hardest things to write, and it's not fun to do for the computer. There's a great tool called Color Thief, which uh, is, does the same thing. So you upload an image, you click on it, and then it gives you the uh, the dominant color and the palette that was used in that thing as well. So that's really beautiful way of using that automatically. Again, you can use it in a node environment to generate a JSON file for every image that you have to get the background colors, for example. Now, this is, getting, this is where it's getting really cool, and this is where I love to be out of my comfort zone because I'm working with a lot of people in machine learning and artificial intelligence right now because they're more intelligent than me, and it's fun to talk to them and see what kind of things they come out with. Uh, image resizing is of course a problem because you, you can resize an image completely and make it completely invisible then. That lady in 200 pixels would be just some yellow and red pixels and you don't know what's going on here. But when you see the resizing that's going on here, so you cut it on the, on the left hand side, uh, you cut it on the right hand side, take the pixels off that you don't need and resize it, or you center it on her face like in the second version, or you actually find the whole outline of the lady and then create only that as, a, as an image. That can be done in Photoshop, of course, but this is a lot of work to do for every image that would be in a gallery. And this is where machine learning comes in, and this is where outline detection and facial detection comes in. There's a JavaScript for that again. There's a JavaScript for everything, really. SmartCrop.js, which does that uh, uh, in Canvas again. Or I think it's WebGL in the background, so it actually has better, uh, uh, better hardware acceleration. Good idea to use, not good idea if you have lots and lots of images because it's very heavy on the machine again. But it shows you the logic of it if, you're looking, if you want to look into it. There's also services for that. Uh, one of them is Cloudinary, which is a, uh, um, yeah, it's a cloud service where you upload your images. And they have all kind of cool parameters when you detect your images and you want to have them in there. So you can resize them, of course, with width and height. But you can also uh, resize them by... Um, uh, by aspect ratio, so you case 16 by 9, 400 pixels. So you don't have to do the math yourself, and it does it automatically for you. You can say center on the face of the person in the image. You can say center on the face and only give me the, the lower part of the image. So all of these are rest parameters in your URL itself, and you don't need to do that, but you can cache them later on, or even better, store them in local storage on user's computer rather than having to rely on the cache of the browser. And they have this uh, wonderful blog post right now where they show how to use that kind of system to do image resizing and intelligent resizing that takes the thumbnails and shows you only the most important part of the image. 
and uh, it's it's a paid for service. They have a free tier as well. But I think if you have lots and lots of images, it really makes sense to to use something like that. There's also Imagix.com. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Image, whatever. Um, they do something even more interesting. They do a, a point of interest cropping. So instead of just centering on the face, they uh, they find the most important part of the image, and they do that by making a high contrast version of the image and then doing the pixel analysis. This is an old trick that we used to do in Flash as well. You remember when you had a camera and detected my hand, for example? Detecting a hand was very simple. If you took the image and changed it into black and white, then you only had the most contrast thing. And then you just counted the pixels where the most pixels were. That's where your hand was. It didn't do any cl clever learning about which, where each finger was. It just showed you, showed you where the biggest amount of pixels were in one row. That's one way of do the, doing that rather quickly. And then uh, the last thing uh, I'm going to call, I don't know what the time is actually, is Project Oxford. That's something I'm working with right now. And that's, um, that's a whole suite of image and video and, uh, and text and uh, speech um, machine learning APIs by Microsoft. So uh, there's a free tier, so you can try them out. You can just get a, uh, an API key. But sooner or later, it costs money because this is a lot of machine burning going on there. But there's some amazing tooling in there that you can use. And you can use that to, to for example, in your uh, content management system to give people a lot of information instead of just expecting them to have alternative text to type it in. So one of the things we have here is feature analysis. So what that one does, I, pr I probably show it live. How about that? Nothing will go wrong ever. For example, it doesn't switch to my Firefox. Good. Uh, there you go. So what we have, for example, here is the vision feature analysis. So what that one does is you upload an image to it, and it tells you all kind of data about that image. So in this case, it's a man, and he's swimming in the water. So the cat category is people swimming. He's 28 years old, and that's where his face is. And you get the data here. And if we didn't have that terrible scrolling thing, I could show it to you easier. We have the data here that it says, like, this is not a black and white, a black and white image. This is not adult content. This is not racy content. And you see in the background here, you've got the color background, color foreground, dominant colors, and accent colors. So that one is automatically generated for you just by uploading an image. And you can do that with any image on the web. You can upload your own ones as well. So this one now here is a train running with a person there, and it says it's a non-line uh, non art. It's train, uh, trains, train station. The colors are, are found for you as well. Again, it's not racy, whereas this lady in a bikini, for example, here is racy content, but it's not adult content. And that's something to sometimes wonder about, you know. And how cool is this to take a, uh, take a folder of images and run this analysis tool over it and have a database of metadata without having to do it yourself, without having to type things in. You have a line drawing thing as well here. If it finds out if it's a line drawing and it's an abstract non-photo, it didn't find the lion. That's kind of weird because I used to work on that for search engines as well. Google has that. Yahoo has that. Bing has that. Most search engines do that kind of stuff under the hood. They just don't give it the data back because all, all free APIs have been killed a year ago. But it's quite amazing what you can find there. And also it finds different faces and different ages. So it's not only one face. And it gives you the data of, these, um, of the faces as well. Where in the image are, where the eyes are, where the noses are, where the mouth is. And that's something that you can do some really interesting bits and bobs with. Um, OCR data, of course, uh, you put a text, you put an image in there with a the text and it gives you the text. That's pretty cool as well. Google had that as part of their Drive API, but it was not an official uh, API. But uh, I basically had my developer tools open and I blocked about it, so they made it official now. Because they had to. But of course, there's error handling. There's errors in there as well. You see, for example, here, it found that bicycle as the number four because it saw that frame here as the number four. So you can't trust it completely, but it gets you 90% of the way and it's better than having no alternative content whatsoever. The thumbnail API does the same thing I talked about. So it finds the most important part of the image and creates a thumbnail accordingly then. And it gives you all of the thumbnails as one data blob to download. So you don't need to resize them yourself uh, if you wanted to. That is important if you have things like this, where now your uh, logo is readable in all the thumbnails and it, it's not only just resized to have lots of white around it and just uh, an unreadable thing in the middle. 
I found that very, uh, very interesting to do. Uh, the other thing we have is emotion detection, which is uh, sometimes hard when you use, for example, Finnish people or something like that. But it's um, uh, face detection and emotion detection. So you got the face API. That one just tells you where in the image is a face. So live demo. Of course, one click is too much. Where you say, okay, we got the lady here. She tried to hide with glasses, but we still found her face. So we got the face rectangle and the landmarks, pupil left, pupil right, and so on and so forth. And you got like three different images, three different people in there. And that machine learning has been getting better and better over the years. I remember there was HP had a computer where it did, didn't detect any black people. So you could unlock your computer by looking into it. And there was tons of videos of people in the shops like, I work here and I can't unlock the computer because it doesn't find me. And that's bad. That's, that's the kind of bad things about, uh, about detection. Of course, once you have that, uh, it, it doesn't only ID the image where the image is, but it gives it a unique ID, like that face ID here. That one allows you then to say, like, are these two people the same in two different pictures? So if you have, for example, an intranet and people upload lots of photos, you can automatically tag who is in these images rather than people having to type that in all the time, much like what Facebook does right now. But that one is as an open API for you to use. And it says, like, okay, is that the same person? No, it's not. Or yes, it is. Uh, what else do we have? These are the vision, uh, vision ones. These are the facial ones. Yeah, the emotion one. And speaker recognition, speech API. We do the same thing about voice right now, which ironically is much, much harder than images. But finding, your, uh, uh, finding what kind of emotion you have while you're speaking, that's something we're still working hard on. It's really easy, not easy to do. But yeah, again, live demo here, if it loads. You basically have the faces. This guy is happy. Um, happiness factor of one. This one as well. They're all happy people because they're basically a, um, a stock photo. Um, there's no happy pe unhappy people allowed. Uh, but this one, for example, has a bit of happiness and a bit of surprise. And it's also got a tooth missing, which should be found, but it doesn't. This lady is unhappy, and it should tell us that, is un that she's unhappy as well. And this is, for example, something that might be cool to take a whole bunch of images and create folders with different emotions and automatically sort them into them. So if you, for example, have an image gallery for people using PowerPoints and you want to have only happy people photos, you can automatically sort them into different folders using this API. Um, uh, I think this is something I'm getting really excited about because, first of all, I have no idea how they do it. But secondly, it's just interesting what you can do with that when you, when you start uh, having a devious mind like mine and you start building random things with it. So what we have, for example, we have the feature analysis here to go through it now just quickly. Facial detection recognition. Emotion recognition. And then you have demos using these services. One of them is howold.net. And probably some of you have seen that because that went viral when it came out because everybody had like, OK, it's wrong. And oh my god, I'm younger. Oh my god, I'm older. Oh my god, I'm not a turtle. And these kind of things. And that one told you like the gender of people and it told you their age. So you click on it. And you use these photos, and it says, like, this guy's happy and 27 years old. And you can upload your own photo and upload it there. For example, me speaking at a TED event. And it says I'm 36 years old, which is only five years off. So, hey, that's not bad. <laughs> and it's not older, so that was quite nice as well. And uh, you can also get a human opinion, try another photo. The fun thing with that one, of course, is 90% of the feedback was like, oh, Microsoft is doing that to collect people's faces. And you're like... <laughs> Yeah, like Google, Facebook, every airport, every shop did this in the last 10 years. But what is amazing about that technology, and I'm, getting, I'm ranting here right now, is that what we also did, for example, is take video analysis and facial recognition and emotion recognition on this. And they do machine learning, for example, for football stadium. And they found out they can now predict riots before they happen by having this kind of information and that kind of data. And that's getting quite interesting if you think about it. Sadly enough, a lot of times you don't get that data. In England, if you're filmed by a CCTV camera, you can talk to the government and request that recording. So there were a few bands that played gigs in front of CCTV cameras and then asked for that as their music video. It's quite fun when you read about laws from time to time. We did mymustache.net uh, my as well, because uh, uh, hipsters exist. I mean, we are in Stockholm as well. 
And what that one does, it finds out if you have a mustache on your face, and then it gives you a ranking of how cool your mustache is. <laughs> and if you don't have a mustache, it paints a mustache on your face, and it does that by finding the, uh, by finding the, the layout. Uh, hang on. So these two, she doesn't have a mustache, of course. He has got a massive beard, and that guy has a little mustache, and this one has a terrible mustache, actually. But it tells you, like, okay, here is where it is, and it's there. This is an SVG kind of tool as well, where we, where we found out how to use SVG, because if you don't have a mustache, like I don't, not anymore, I'm not that German anymore, uh, it actually paints a mustache on you, and you can select from different ones and can share it on, on Facebook, so that's pretty cool. So if you can't grow one, this tool will do it for you. And then last, we had Twins or Not, where you uploaded two pictures of people, and it said, like, how far, uh, how close to each other are you uh, in terms of looks? So in my case, I uploaded my picture, and then I do a search for Pippi Longstocking. <laughs> and see how far away we are from each other, and it's only... Didn't do that one, did the original one. And it's, I think, 17% of Pippi Longstocking. <laughs> so think about these tooling. Think about optimizing your images. Think about generating background colors just by analyzing the images. Think about EXIF data and finding the thumbnails in it. And play with these APIs like Cloudinary, Imagix. Uh, there's lots of services out there. And if you want to know more about Project Oxford, I'm going to be in our booth uh, all afternoon after I've written my other talk. So this is what i got to do now. But other than that, that's me. And it's up to you to keep the web exciting and usable for the next generation of users. Don't get too excited about making everything pretty. Make it accessible and making it useful. It's not about the prettiest, it's about who performs the best, is most accessible and usable, and gives things to the people that are coming on the web right now, and not only the ones that are already on it. That's all I had, thank you very much.